you everybody for your patience. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for attending. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is the fourth in our series of um, our uh, equity talks. And today we're gonna be focusing on infrastructures um, for equity. So what is what are the infrastructures firstly that make up SIPCAI? And um, how do we think about equity when we think about these infrastructures? And also uh, what are the challenges um, that might come up and how can we do better? So that's really the focus for today. And we'll be looking broadly kind of in a cross-cutting way across the guy, across different um, uh, infrastructures. And um, uh, for instance, uh, in my role as VP at large, I look at um, infrastructures such as the Gary Martin Travel Awards, the Sikai Development Fund. Um, there's a medium publication uh, section on the voices of Sikai. So these are all different infrastructures that um, that exclude and include in different ways. And um, those are some of the things that we'll be talking about. And I'm uh, here um, as co-organizer along with Shawen Bartzel. So Shawen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, I'm Shawan Bartel, professor in College of Information Sciences and Technology at Penn State University. Like Neha, I'm also vice president at large on the Sikai Executive Committee. Um, in the context of that role, uh, last year I worked with a group of amazing people to establish Sikai Cares. This is an advocacy group for those who experience discrimination and harassment at our professional events. Um, wearing my CSCW 2021 paper co-chair hat, we implemented a formal decision appeal process for authors in the event that they feel a review is unfair, um, inappropriate, or problematic. So these are but two examples of infrastructures that we have in Sikai in recent years that aim to create positive change. There are many others and we can certainly do more. Um, and we look forward to learn more about what you think the most pressing issues are in the context of infrastructure in equity in today's session. And Neha and I just want to once again, give a big shout out to Kale and Miriam for volunteering their time to moderate and sketch note the session. We will also want to acknowledge many of you who have been attending these equity talk sessions. And we also are very grateful to our colleagues on the Sikai EC um, for making these events possible. We're planning more of these equity roundtable sessions. The next one will be on gender equity. And this is scheduled for April 23rd at 12 p.m. PST. Um, we hope you can join us. With that, we will turn the session to Kale, our moderator. Thank you once again for being here today. Thanks, Shaolin. Um, Yeah, so I'm still Kale Passmore, pronouns they, them, or he, him. Uh, I'm an HCI researcher and interdisciplinary knowledge worker coming to you live from a windy, unceded Treaty 6 territory in Canada, which is ancestral and current homeland of the Soto, the Cree, the Diné, the Dakota, Lakota, um, the Métis, and many other First Nations peoples. It's 6 a.m. here, which is about six hours sooner than I'd prefer to be up, but y'all mean so much to me I'm here anyway. Uh, and since I'm sure you're all tired of hearing me situate myself, I'm just going to post a link in the chat to a film, The Past System, um, which is a brilliantly investigated documentary on a less discussed form of government mandated racial segregation um, here in Canada. So with all of that said, um, I'm just going to quickly cover the code of conduct in brief and let you know it's available in full at a link that'll be posted in the chat while I do this. While I'm talking here, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, if comfortable, provide your pronouns, location, and something you'd like others to know about you. That goes for whenever you post your illustrious wisdom, um, please state your name, affiliation, and pronouns when you begin. Um, and you can add your pronouns to your username by right-clicking the box containing your face in the Zoom window and selecting rename. 
It's not required, but it is encouraged. So as a round table, anyone's free to offer their critiques, their solutions, to share their experiences at any point in time. Uh, this is a collaborative discussion of issues and potential solutions around reviewing and, or sorry, around the infrastructures of, yeah, SIGCHI and equity at SIGCHI. I'm here to keep us on track and facilitate as equitable a discussion uh, and dialogue as possible. So to let you know, the session will be recorded and by attending the round table within this time, your consent is ongoing. Uh, any participation in the comments, um, whenever you speak will be recorded, including the content posted to the chat. For the same reasons of privacy and consent, we ask you not share content from the talk on social media. Um, we'll post this in full with additional accessibility options afterward. Um, and if you're posting after the event, hashtag SIGCHI and hashtag equity talk will be your hashtags of choice. Uh, if you absolutely must discuss something potentially harmful, stressful, or sensitive, we ask you to provide a content warning. Um, we have LiveCart, uh, ASL interpreter. We have additional accessibility options that'll be available for the video afterward. Um, if you require any additional services, just message me or another one of our organizers here. So Shawen, Neha, um, Olena, you can also contact. And yeah, our time together here serves to highlight the complicated interactions between individual experiences and systemic policies. That's what these talks are about. Um, these can be sources of ongoing frustration and oppression for many. Um, these are sensitive subjects and topics, sensitive areas of experience. So I'd like you to keep in mind that that frustration, should it arise, is valid. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we're an internationally diverse group of humans. So be patient show sensitivity to anyone who has the floor, keep aware of how much time and space you're taking up and that others may need a moment of silence to collect themselves before speaking. Um, we ask you to be critical, but constructively so. Be kind. Um, not everyone comes to these talks, comes to these spaces with the same education level or the same culture when it comes to social issues, social justice, or matters of identity. Not everyone um, yeah, has equal access to these institutions, to these communities, or to this knowledge. So there may be times when identifying words or phrases are insensitive or just don't feel right to you. Um, if these issues come up, take each other in good faith, offer a quick correction, and then refocus on the topic of the moment. I'd like to remind you all that people's experiences are not up for debate. Uh, and in the event of any harassment, discrimination, or additional needs by another attendee or presenter, just directly contact the moderator, which is me, uh, Neha or Shawen. We have a Slido, which will be linked in the chat uh, for posting and upvoting questions as a secondary way to engage. Uh, as the event is striving for equitable dialogue um, and is not a sort of Q&A or AMA, we have to balance comments from the speakers, from the comments, and from Slido. So any questions we don't get around to or can't address, uh, we will open up for discussion in the Equity Talks Discord channel and in the preceding blog post. So with that whole spiel done and said, uh, I think we can begin by what we'd like to call just sort of naming the problem. Um, we're here to talk about infrastructures. So these systems that we put in place or fail to put in place, like the travel awards, development funds, uh, SIGCHI chapters. Um, and that's sort of what we're taking a close look at during this session. So to name the problem, um, what do you think is or are the most pressing problems we face regarding equity in the context of the infrastructures that you're part of, that you're working toward the success of? And absolutely anyone is welcome to start us off here. So Andy has actually added in the chat, the cost of participation in conferences, um, which is an excellent place to start. The sort of like class 
plus region issue. <laughs> So I think we've seen at a couple of different conferences, especially recently, I'm thinking of Kai Play, um, the upcoming Kai, there has been different admission or registration costs for people coming from say different regions. Um, there's different tiers of access. So we know that sort of thing is possible, but I'm wondering actually if any of the organizers or past GCs of conferences might be able to touch on why there's sort of like different costs, different um, levels of financial access that might be available. Mm. And Kata has actually added to that the cost of volunteering where you have to pay everything in advance and then be reimbursed, which is clearly less accessible to say like PhD students. Nick has added in the chat, um, non-specific provocation. I would like to ask people's thoughts on the type of management structures best suited to diversity and inclusion and whether we should think about changing them. The current hierarchical form of leadership seems to inherit from traditions of universities and corporates more than, for instance, flatter participatory structures such as community grassroots or other leaderless forms. Yet the Kai communities are diverse and not all of those hierarchical forms, which is a great question. Y'all are a very chatty bunch this morning. So you wanted to wanted someone to talk about the um, cost of conferences, right? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll give it a go. Um, I'm Minoba Vinagamuthi, she, her. Uh, I'm based in London. I work at the BBC. Um, I am the Sekai AC for Equity um, for this term. And I'm, I've also been a steering committee member at a small conference called IMX, uh, Interactive Media Experiences, for a couple of years now. Um, I'm currently the VP for conferences there. So uh, that is essentially looking where to get take the conference next and uh, how to keep the conference going annually. Um, I'm also the general chair or co-general chair with Yvette uh, at um, New Jersey Institute of Technology for 2021. So the cost of conference, conferences are for nonprofit. Um, any amount of money that we make uh, at the end of the conference pretty much goes back into a pot and is used either for the next conference or for initiatives of uh, of some sort. Um, so when we look at registration cost, we essentially try to make them in a way that we are not losing money. At the end of the day, we try and um, we essentially don't want to lose money. And so that's what uh, we are trying to do. If we get enough sponsorships from um, in different companies and things like that, that all affects uh, how what the registration cost is. But generally we try to, uh, you know, venue is a big one uh, food and drinks, um, and then, you know, sort of swag, things like that, I suppose, are 
what makes up the bulk of the cost. And we kind of try and then make that back in the registration cost uh, for people. Uh, traditionally, in Diamex at least, we try and give uh, members of Sikai uh, a little bit of a discount. Um, and we also have this idea of early registration versus late registration so that uh, we can try and, you know, for logistical matter, manners, get uh, sort of uh, food at a lower cost, maybe, and things like that. So if you if you book things ahead of time, we get a lower cost. And so that can be passed on in registration costs and things like that. Last year, everyone went virtual. And so we kept costs really low. Um, in a way, I suppose it, it was more inclusive. Um, we did a lot of the volunteer work of ourselves. So the chairs, the technical chairs, the uh, diversity chairs, um, people like that essentially gave up a lot of their time to build things on free platforms. So last year, for instance, IMX was on uh, Mozilla Hubs. Um, the lovely people at Mozilla Hubs helped us uh, do some of the work. And then it was essentially a lot of late nights getting it up and running. But that, of course, is not a sustainable way of running conferences. And so this year, um, even though conferences are still virtual, including IMX, um, a lot of conferences have then gone on to get a, a platform provider. And so the registration costs have come down, but not as much as last year. Um, and of course, with the ACM giving this, uh, the idea of having discounted rates for different countries and this tiered option, CHI and IMX last year, for instance, gave uh, a substantial discounts for people uh, in communities we really want to get involved in our sort of uh, IMX kind of community. So, you know, if people who we, um, who I am, who, a who the ACM uh, essentially categorizes as uh, from an economically developing country. And so those people would get a discounted rate. And of course, students were something, uh, another group of people uh, who got discounted rates as well. Um, so that kind of is an overview of how we sort of look at cost and how we try to give discounts and things like that. We also have, of course, uh, the Sikai Global Development Fund and uh, IMX, like many other conferences, uh, will essentially apply uh, to them to get a little pot of money, which we can then redistribute as either registration waivers or travel cost or things like that uh, to further help people who might need uh, that extra bit of help to get to the conference. Um, so yes, it is expensive, especially if you go to a country like, you know, a European country or a um, like New York, which is where IMX would have been physically this year if we were going there, um, because the cost of running a conference there is quite expensive. Um, but at the same time, if you go to other countries, there are still the same sort of cost you get. Uh, it, it's not all that much cheaper as such either. So it is a interesting issue every year, every single set of organizers, we sit down there and we try and figure out what the registration cost should be. Um, if there are any other models that might work, we should certainly look at them. Awesome. Thank you, Vina. Um, to catch some people up here in the chat, uh, we have a Comments saying the use of bandwidth heavy and or mobile unfriendly conferencing tools serves to sideline participation from mobile first individuals and economies. Um, Geraldine has added cost of participation. Aaron and Yoshi 20, uh, Kai 2021 chairs wrote a great blog post detailing what is covered in the registration fees and the conference budget in case that helps. Um, she's also posted a link. And Andy has said, Yes, remote, participa remote participation is very important for people to avoid the cost of hotels and international travel, not to mention carbon footprint. Uh, can we make virtual participation an option available for every conference, which comments have seemed to, yeah, people seem to be very much in favor of here. So I think, uh, Nikki has added, will ACM's ability 
to be so financially flexible continue when or if physical conferences return. It helps with publicity at the moment. Susan's added, the cost of volunteering in general is also an issue. For some, example, those in academia, service is rewarded to a degree, but for others, most in industry, service is done on stolen time. And when I was self-employed, every hour I spent on Sig Chi was an hour I did not work um, or get paid. So I could not do a lot of things that took a lot of time, like chairing a conference. This further perpetuates the lack of industry folks in Sig Chi, especially in leadership. I feel that schism between academia and industry, and industry is quite problematic, uh, and the cost of volunteering is a significant difference, which I think is a great point to bring up, especially given how many student volunteers a lot of these conferences run on. Um, that takes time away from PhD. Service is important for experience and connection, but often detracts from, say, finding additional funding, from getting coursework done a thousand other complications. So yeah, there's a lot of costs around um, the volunteering. Joseph has also added, has anyone ever tried a pay what you can approach? I'd be curious to see how that would work out. In some trials, it has produced more revenue, but I think that was in a charity cafe, not a conference context. I can't imagine anyone would like to take uh, the risk, but it'd be cool if it could work. Um, yeah. Vino's also added, I'm really excited about the idea of remote participation, both as a conference organizer and as a researcher in social VR. The issue I think we have to handle is making sure it doesn't become a two-tiered experience. Um, and then we have added spinning off on that. How about don't pay if you cannot instead, which I think is a great point. So we have a few different models being presented or at least a few different ways of looking at this um, with different levels of hierarchy implicit to that, different amounts of volunteer work, um, labor from different people. Christians added at Nick, I guess we would need an organizational structure and procedures that assure long-term goals. These goals need to be developed bottom up and shouldn't depend that much on who holds the positions. This way, more people would feel represented. Um, and Vino's added, Mozilla do festivals and unconferences with the pay what you can idea. So has anyone currently in the room been to a conference that's employed, say one of these pay what you can or pay what don't pay if you can't models, um, or it's actually just organized themselves quite differently from a lot of the Sig Chi conferences that we've been to or seen. Yeah. Right. Um, so as I said, Mozilla has these uh, festivals that you can go to and they give you a recommended um, payment. I think the last thing was last time was 45 pounds and then you pay more if you can and if, if you can't pay then you don't pay but they have an organization behind them so they put the they take the bulk of the uh, conference venue so it's a very privileged position to be able to do that so for instance BBC does free uh, conferences and free sort of um, get togethers where we will focus on a topic and it will go for like two, three days. And so we have, uh, you know, journalism and fake news, for instance, that was one that happened just uh, recently. And people could attend because we have venues, um, we can, we can give the cost of the food and things, you take on travel, obviously, but then you're invited to join in and attend uh, for free. Um, and even though we are for nonprofit, similar to, uh, you know, we we still, I guess, in a way, define the theme of the conference and what we want to talk about. So I think you, with those models, someone is paying for it. And therefore, who has the power in figuring out what you talk about in these conferences, that all changes if we are not all contributing towards the cost of the conference. So I think these are interesting models that we should definitely think about but then everything does cost money. And so if the money is not coming from us as registration attendees, 
it's coming from somewhere else, uh, either through sponsorship or through company um, kind of uh, in-kind contributions. And naturally, they will obviously have an input into what you talk about. That's There's always going to be that kind of give and take, I think. So. Yeah, and I think therein lies one of the major tensions, right? That <laughs> we want conferences to be more accessible and therefore cheaper, but that also would require more volunteer effort, more free labor, more industry involvement, say. Um, and these are things that are equally sort of protested or problematic in their own right. Um, so finding or striking a balance between those dynamics seems really, really important. Um, Geraldine, I see that you have your hand raised if you'd like to offer something. Uh, yes, how do I get my hand down? Just let me lower my hand here. Um, Geraldine Fitzpatrick from TU Vienna, currently stranded in Brisbane, so it's very late at night. Um, she, her, uh, I really hear and agree with the call for more virtual and hybrid conference formats. And having chaired uh, CHI 19 and sitting on the steering committee, the CHI conference is a really challenging conference to think about making any of these changes quickly. Because of the scale of the conference, just the, you know, find, there are very few sites worldwide that, that take the numbers that we have and the mix of rooms that we need. And we're already in the process of trying to book venues for 2026 or the people who are involved in that. And, you know, that's risky because we don't know what are going to be the current models then either. And so it's, you know, I wonder whether some of these alternative models, whether it's of sort of hybrid uh, or and or different sort of registration models, are really good models to explore in some of the smaller conferences where the risks might be a little bit lower and the financial risk more manageable because those financial implications are carried a lot by SIG CHI generally and will affect lots of the conferences and lots of the support programs that are available. Um, you know, so one of my concerns about hybrid, just hearing what the costs are involved in running a virtual platform those costs are huge. I mean, not as huge as hiring a big venue, but they're still like, my, I can't remember what they are, but they're, they're pretty mind blowing compared to what I thought they might have been. And so if we're having hybrid, we could end up, I don't know, inadvertently having conferences that are even more expensive because we've got to do all the physical infrastructure booked X years ahead. And we don't really know how to anticipate the numbers. And all of the virtual infrastructure to provide an, an a, you know like an equitable conference experiences for those online. So you know, some of the, someone said in the comments that it's not two tier experience. So I guess I'm just trying to say it's complete. It's really complicated. Um, it's really complicated. And then no one is doing this, trying to make money or trying to you know, screw people. In fact, everyone's doing all their very best to keep costs as low as possible. Um, and we never know how many registrations we're going to get. So, you, you know, I know when we had 19, CHI 19, for example, we had sort of like the, the bare bones that we just had to have for the conference. And then you have the whole wish list of things you want to have, um, ideally. And then slowly, as you start to see the registration numbers come in, you can sort of go, yay, we can do two biscuits, two cookies for people at morning tea instead of one or something like that. It sounds trivial, but they're the sorts of little incremental add-ons that you can do. And it's always this juggling act. So yeah, so I just wonder whether some of the smaller conferences might be ways of exploring some of the practical logistics of this and to, to test the willingness of people, I don't know, to pay as you can or whatever. Um, but for something bigger like CHI or CSCW, uh, it might be sort of a slower change process. And we don't know, you know, but I'm sure we're going to come out of this whole COVID experience with different conference models, but what they'll be, I don't know. Thanks so much, Geraldine. Um, yeah, we have a couple of extra comments here. Uh, 
So Nick has said, at Christian, thanks. How do we ensure everyone feels represented with our structures? Do we need more people representing us to ensure diversity is well accounted for? For example, I doubt many in Africa would feel as represented as in the US. Um, Julie has added, one improvement that I like is decoupling registration and presentation, i.e. making accept papers um, register. There we go, yeah. As a way of ensuring financial stability for the conference, um, PACM conferences, for example, don't require you to register. Alisa has added, Last year, as chair of ACM Interaction Design and Children Conference 2020, we organized the conference fully online. We had a good pot from sponsors, and given that the online conference cut some big figures in the budget, we passed the message that if anyone had issues in participating because they could not afford, we'd be happy to support them. Um, we had a, wide, a widest and largest participation compared to previous years and positive budget for ACM. Online conferences can improve the ability of people to participate and make it more affordable. Uh, and Andy has said, plus one Geraldine, we need to prototype with smaller events, not the Kai conference first. Um, and Geraldine's offered us a link with site selection process um, to sort of explain the decision-making process that goes into a lot of this. Um, so, oh. Okay, I see that Vinoba has added, I think there's value in physical and virtual conferences. I wonder if the model of going virtual one year and going physical the next might be one we explore. Uh, and Alex, I see that you have your hand up if you'd like to add in here. Hi, thanks, Kel. Um, I'm Alex Taylor. I uh, he, him, I'm based in London at City University. Um, I wanted to say first just how excited I am that we're dealing um, and talking about infrastructure here and it feels to me as though infrastructure is actually you know what lies at the heart of many problems with equity um, and, I, and I also really like hearing about all the different ideas that people have you know in, in the chat and in previous um, meetings that we've had um, under this series. And to me, it's almost as though the ideas are not the problem. You know, we've got so many good people here with um, so many sort of ambitious ideas and the impetus to change. But the problem is, is, is precisely the topic of this, um, this particular session, infrastructures. You know, what, what at an infrastructural level do we start to change? And I guess I was starting to think, given this conversation about registration, to me, registration is a really practical problem that there can be many ideas could be thrown at it to try ameliorating the conditions of inequity. Um, but what, what's the, and just reflecting on that, that thread of conversation, I was thinking, what are the, the attitudes or the conditions that we want to, to set for ourselves that might enable equity across all these sorts of issues that we're confronting and how might we change the way we approach them and so you know Geraldine and I think others in the chat have mentioned risk well how do we approach risk differently what might we do differently with risk that allows us maybe to think um, to change the structures that we're operating in um, I, I also really like um, sort of notions of experimentation. You know, what, what can we do to, to try different things out? So as Geraldine suggested, you know, maybe in smaller conferences, we try other things and we do it quickly. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to kind of reiterate the Silicon Valley, you know, break it and get it wrong, all that sort of thing. But I, I do think experimentation is this kind of really rich resource we have for, for kind of reorienting ourselves to to structural problems. Um, and, and I know Daniela's on this call as well. Daniela and I have been thinking a lot about the conditions of possibility as a kind of phrase to think with. And it's like, what can that phrase allow us to do at the structural level for, to treat and to understand problems of equity differently? Um, so, you know, every one of these issues around registration, payment, et cetera, I think, um, should come with a certain kind of attitude towards equity, a certain kind of approach for risk-taking, experimentation, et cetera. Um, so I, you know, I'd be interested to hear whether um, others are kind of thinking at that level of sort of uh, working infrastructurally.
Daniela, I see you have your hand up. And then Kagonia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, just to jump in, thanks so much, Alex, for starting that that thread. I think I wanted to say I'm, I'm Daniela Rosner um, and also she, her, and both Alex and I and um, Mikhail Weibrook are, are working as editors in chief currently for the Interactions Magazine, which is something we we wanted to also bring to light in this conversation about uh, infrastructure, not to take us away from conferences, but I think really as, as a way of disseminating ideas um, and conceptions of how we can change the infrastructure or take risks in new ways, um, it would be important, I think, to hear from more of you as to how, how you might use interactions or similar kinds of platforms to do some of that discussion work or debate work and how we can better support you in that facility and capacity. Thank you. Oh, I think you're on mute, sorry. Not yet. That's enough? Bad, you're perfect. Oh, yay. It's these um, headphones. They just don't talk very well with these um, tools. Yeah, so thank you very much, Kelly. Yes, you did get my name right. My name is Kargonia. I've met many of you through different fora, and it's very good to, um, to see you all here again. So uh, my comment was, oh, I'm, I work at Microsoft. I joined recently. Um, I'm speaking to you guys from Nairobi, Kenya, where um, I'm currently based. And um, my comment was around um, participation and allowing for different sorts of groups of people to participate. So I'll start with a funny story. So um, I registered for, um, for CHI 2021. And because I'm in Kenya and I'm Kenyan, when I went through the list of, you know, where do I, what registration amount do I pay for? Of course, I gravitated to where Kenya was placed. And Kenya is in the category of, um, I think that's ABCDFG, if I remember well. And it cut the long story short, whatever I was meant to pay was much, much significantly lower than the standard fee. But then again, it's not me paying, it's my company paying. So you see that disconnect, right? Um, what I'm trying to attend to is this um, direct sort of grouping according to um, either geographical you know, location as opposed to the person, right? So I want to shift from that because I think sometimes we, we, we are often categorized as no, less than or the poor ones and it gets a bit tiring and exhausting so i think what i'd recommend is please just move people to um let us choose i like the pay pay if you pay what you can or do not pay if you cannot uh, proposals um because always having it always appear that yeah, the less than the, the poor ones will pay this much is, is not a complete representation. It can be an individual in London who prefer to pay $45 as opposed to $220, for example. So I think that is an, uh, an approach. And I like Alex talking about let's be daring to try new things. Let us kind of like embrace the individuality of individual of people. And maybe that will, will, um, will help things better. Another thing I like, and I think Nick mentioned this is around encouraging participation. So I think in many of these discussions, um, and I like that the payment structure is really attending to encouraging participation from all corners. Um, I'm just wondering what more we can do, and I'm happy to contribute to that, whether it's time-wise or whatever, what more we can do. So when we're having these discussions about encouraging participation from certain pockets of people, we can have the people from those pockets actually take part in those discussions. So it then doesn't seem like it is a decision made for them without them, because it then might end up being um, confusing, like it was for me, choosing the wrong category that it's not me paying. So it's actually my boss, uh, Jackie, who, Jackie O'Neill, who I'm sure many of you know, was like, no, actually, you don't choose that one, and you know, you don't have to choose that, right? And the funny thing is, not it's not like if I didn't work for Microsoft, I would not have afforded to pay whatever the amount it was. It's just that if you're going to give me a cheaper option, then I'll take it. So um, just, um, I guess I'm just exhausted of always being categorized as less than, um, and and I'm not. So I think that's that's it. Like as a Black African woman, um, I I'm not even the word privilege. I have some thing against that. So it's not that I'm the unprivileged. I'm not the picture of not privilege. I'm just a person. Um, I'm a researcher and you know enjoying computer science like many of you are. So I think we should find a way of 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 separating um, geography and race and gender. 
from all these other structures that we're trying to 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 make equitable. Yeah, that, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, chat also seems to be relatively, for you know, being the time that it is, blowing up in support of everything that you just said there. Um, I'm going to take a quick second here to just read through a few of the comments that have been posted. Uh, yeah, Susan's added, what types of diversity are we trying to encourage? There are obviously many to consider and are all equally important. Uh, Soroya has added, are conferences expenses public? Could potential participants vote on what efforts and resources would be better than others? For example, more accessibility accommodations than in expensive hotels to host the event. Um, Susan's added, excellent point. We've focused on conferences, but there are lots of ways to participate. For example, interactions. Kata added, gotta say, having published the suggestion for phrasing gender questions in surveys and interactions was one of the most effective things to make a non-binary perspective public across disciplines. Alex, has said, thank you, Daniela, absolutely. Interactions is a platform where we're keen to take risks and create the conditions for different kinds of worlds. In other words, we're open to experimentation. Um, and Julie has posted a very useful link um, showing that all conference budgets and histories are available. And we've been left with sort of two questions, one in Slido, one in chat. Um, one actually, sorry, is a statement, not a question. Uh, there's a chicken egg issue with representation, sadly. When people uh, don't feel represented, they don't volunteer and the gulf increases. And the question, how do we make virtual conferences a bit less boring? Zoom fatigue is real. So absolutely anyone is welcome to pick up on any of the many things I just tossed at y'all. Alex has added, yes, these inequities run through many of our infrastructures in so many ways. We're never going to solve them, but we need to think together about allowing for difference in many ways. Management is always a site for structures of inequity. Um, and decoupling gender, geography, and race from infrastructures. So taking a sort of person first approach or situation specific approach. Um, hi, um, uh, my name is Teresa Tannenbaum. I am, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at UC Irvine in the Department of Informatics. And I'm, I'm here uh, partially in my capacity as the VP of Publications on the Sig Chi Executive Committee, uh, a role that I've been in for uh, only a few months and I'm still sort of orienting myself to. Uh, and also in my capacity as a member of Sig Chi Cares and, and as somebody who's been doing a lot of equity work and advocacy within our community. And uh, I wanted to, I'm not sure if I have a question so much as a perspective that has become increasingly clear to me as I've seen our community from these different roles. Um, and the, the reason I ended up in the role of a VP of pubs is because I made a nuisance of myself. Uh, I made a nuisance of myself to the ACM because I'm a transgender woman who wanted to change her name on her previously published work and was denied the opportunity to do so by the ACM systems and platforms and policies. And I was able to join an ongoing effort that a few other transgender individuals had started within our community, uh, but then had gotten burned out on because the, the work of trying to advocate for change inside of our community can be exhausting and emotionally taxing and labor intensive and it's it's thankless it's unpaid it's challenging and i was fortunate enough to be at a point in my life and career where i could take on a lot of extra labor to to help develop policies to help push policies forward and, and i've been able to make some changes to, to how we approach these these issues uh, and in the process i've learned that in order to change our infrastructures, we often need to change our social consensus around the around what we consider equitable as a community. And, and this is something that I encounter a lot as a member of the executive committee where or as care of cares where people come to us with a concern or a complaint 
or, or some difficulty they're facing, whether it be with a reviewing process or with some aspect of PCS. And the concern of the complaint often assumes some degree of power or authority on the part of the folks who are in service and, and responsibility positions within our community. It assumes that the executive committee has the power to, to repair that for them, that the CARES has the ability to, in some way, provide a solution to the, the problem that they're encountering. And yet from the other side, we encounter time and again that actually we have virtually no power to make changes and that the only times we change things at the level of the institution, at the level of the ACM, is when we produce a large enough consensus within our community and the broader public conversation around those things to actually produce uh, a real change. And so for the, the, for the name change policy, in order for me to apply enough pressure to the ACM to get an inclusive name change policy produced, I, I first had to write an article in Springer Nature advocating for this. I had to join the Committee of Publication Ethics and uh, create a working group that uh, was offering guidance to all the publishers underneath their umbrella. I had to form my own separate working group of over 50 people uh, across a myriad of disciplines, all applying pressure to their publishers. Uh, and I had to like essentially change the global consensus on whether or not the publishing community was willing to accommodate inclusive name change practices. Um, and we did this and it's working and we're applying pressure and, and we're, we're now hitting the ceiling of, of ACM doesn't have the resources or the budget to actually follow through with the policies that we've adopted. And we're, we're struggling with the fact that no matter how good our intentions are, if our institution isn't willing to resource those intentions, they fall flat. Um, and so this is, and I'm seeing a, a number of posts from women in the chat who are, who are observing that things like name changes are, are something that are desirable and valuable and beneficial to not just trans people, but to anybody who changes their name throughout their life and their career, which is many of us. Um, and so I think it's worth taking a step back and looking at the way that power is related to our infrastructures and the ways in which our infrastructures are reflections of systems of power. And, and we as a community lack any kind of institutional power beyond that which we're able to produce a consensus around or behind. And so when it comes to infrastructuring equity, we have to build coalitions, we have to build big groups and those have to extend beyond the Kai community into the broader academic and scholarly community, because that's how we get the power that we need to hold our institutions accountable. Uh, and so I don't know that there's a question there, but just a perspective that, that I've come to uh, through sort of blood, sweat, and tweet tears over the last couple of years. No, oh, thank you so much, Tess. Um, and a lot of people in chat are agreeing with you and showing appreciation, gratitude for all that blood, sweat, and tears you've poured into this. Um, yeah, just going to the comments. Uh, Stacy's added, Tess, this is an, even an issue for women who marry and change their name. Older pubs are hard to track and get recognized. Uh, Tess and Stacy, I have publications with three different names for this reason. Um, yeah, <laughs> Alex has said at Tess, good for you. We need to make a nuisance of ourselves. Sarah Ahmed talks a lot about killjoys and complaint. Uh, it's a heavy burden and labor, but one we need to make the space for and enable. Again, this is something we can do structurally. Um, and yeah, Neha and Shawan both say thank you. I think, I think that's actually a great point in, we have what, about seven minutes. If one or two of you would like to pick up on, yeah, just structures of accountability, maybe more democratic infrastructures or more lateralized infrastructures, opportunities that might be missed um reasons that sort of inaccessibility to structural and systemic change um yeah yeah nick i see you have your hand up so i got told to put my hand up i more or less said everything that i i wanted to say on the chat which is about the asking people how they feel about structural change a couple of points that I'd like to sort of amplify on that to make it to perhaps open up a bit. 
Um, the first point is about the numbers of people that we need to represent us. I mean, obviously we can't all be on uh, every sort of structure, but at the moment, the sort of pointy top is pretty pointy compared to the numbers of people in Sikai, right? So it could be a little bit softer, more curvy shaped at the top rather than a real point. Um, so I wonder how people feel about that. It's possible they haven't had experiences with that type of structure, but certainly working with community networks and communities, I have more experience and it's not nearly as scary as you might think it is. It does work sometimes. <laughs> um, and the other thing I'm um, picking up with from Tess, and I think Alex said this, um, to make space for the killjoys and complainers. I think more than that, I think we have to reward them actually reward them because I know from things that I put out 10, 10 years or so ago in the sort of the first start stuff on the decolonial and racist stuff from a white person's perspective that hasn't got me any points in my career it's been a real problem I now maybe not now but I've paid huge penalties for the things that I've said huge penalties and, and I think that if we really are genuinely interested in changing this space, we stop rewarding the status quo and we actually reward people that take those, emo do that emotional labor, whether that's um, Tess or, or any one of us. And I suspect there's a whole load of people in this list who have done that labor at some point or time or other. That's sort of, I hope that I've amplified enough now. No, that's a great point. Thank you, Nick. Um, we have about four minutes. So I'm wondering actually if Neha or Shawen, you'd like to give us a last thought or close out the recorded portion here. I'm not sure actually if we'll be continuing for half an hour after this or not. So I think that we can uh, continue. Um, for those of us who might want to, because there are conversations that are, I think, still to be had in some of the threads that were in the chat. And what we do for those of you who are here for the first time, we just stay back and that part of the session isn't recorded. Um, so we, we just chatted in the past. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think that we could, um, we could wrap up. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on conferences, um, we had a rich discussion about reviewing uh, last week, and we'll be continuing uh, some of these conversations by getting into um, uh, other details around volunteering and mentoring and such. Um, uh, I um, also wanted to invite you all to continue these conversations on the Discord um, that we started for the Sikai Equity Talks, and we have a, a channel for each of these sessions. Um, but uh, other than that, I think, uh, yes, the next session is going to be on the 23rd, and that's when we're going to be talking about gender. Um, Shawen, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. Again, uh, we every single session of, of these equity talks will be written up, and there will be recording available for you to check out as well. Just make sure that um, you um, follow up. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and just before the recording ends, wanted to sort of give a shout out and huge thank you to the, all the organizers and aides making these talks possible. So it'll be Neha, Shawan, Adriana, Vinoba, Stacy, Soraya, Teresa, Olena, uh, Miriam, uh, and today, Miss Jeffrey and Cynthia. Um, so 